Uh, so for those of you, and that's many of you, who have never been to the Lost Marble Salon, this is a monthly-ish event series, and each salon is dedicated to a particular, usually general theme. Past themes have included uh, bodies, time, space, secrets, circuits, identity. Tonight's, and some, these themes are so broad, so we might devote a number of salons to a given theme. So there's a Bodies Part 1, Bodies Part 2. Tonight will be the very first salon dedicated to the theme of waste. <clears throat> and I'm very excited about the performers and the presenters that we have joining us this evening. I'm going to kick things off as your resident anthro, anthro, uh, anthropologist. I think that's the right the right phrase to describe what I do, uh, to give you a general introduction to the theme of waste. So I'm going to introduce waste by discussing three things, uh, dirt, trash, and shit. <laughs> so Biz, if you wouldn't mind going to the first slide. So, Dirt is not a natural category of the world. It's a concept that we impose onto the world. Uh, the anthropologist Mary Douglas wrote a pretty influential book in 1966 called Purity and Danger, where she introduced this notion that what dirt is, conceptually, culturally, is matter out of place. And I think that's a useful place for us to start. Um, she said, quote, dirt is the byproduct of a systematic ordering and classification of matter insofar as ordering involves rejecting inappropriate elements. There is no such thing as absolute dirt. It exists in the eye of the beholder. Dirt offends, offends against odor. Eliminating, eliminating it is not a negative movement, but a positive effort to organize the environment. So, I mean, there's some, that's, uh, you know, kind of an academic way of saying something that I think is fairly intuitive, like, there's the cliche that everybody loves the smell of their own farts. <laughs> now, well, there's true. probably nothing. <laughs> there's something really I'm going to for You know, and there's, there's nothing objectively different about the odor that comes out of your body than what comes out of most other people's bodies, but you certainly experience it as different. Uh, here's another <laughs> example. So hair, especially in American culture, we both embrace it as the epitome of beauty, and it's sold to us, it's, its image is sold to us, uh, and it's also the epitome of disgust. So a clogged drain. I don't know what your reaction is. Some people even get a gag reflex when they see something like that. Mm -hmm. But again, what's the difference between the hair on the left and the hair on the right? Water and soap residue? You know. <laughs> but clearly, one is matter out of place, and the other is not. One is filthy and dirty and needs to be avoided, and the other is the polar opposite, something that needs to be embraced and achieved. Um, here's another example. What's your reaction to this image? Just what do you free associate to when you see it? What is it? Painter. Painter. Hard labor. Work. Hard labor. Hard labor work. <laughs> Mechanic. <laughs> yeah. So I think, I mean, it's a it's a pair of dirty hands, but. <laughs> whose hands these are will matter in terms of how we experience its dirtiness. So if I tell you this is a mechanic, that you experience it one way. Um, if I tell you this is a gardener, you experience it another way. If I tell you this is a homeless person in Central Square, you experience it another way. If I tell you this is a Syrian refugee, you know, crossing into the Hungarian border or something, you experience it another way. So objectively, the dirt is not different across these different kinds of people, but we categorize it and experience it very differently depending on um, the kind of person we associate it with. And so here, a dirty feet on a homeless person. And again, we can't help but react to the dirt uh, in, in a particular emotional way that speaks to how we are conceptualizing it and not experiencing it as this uh, objective things. Mary Douglas said, uh, 
there's no absolute thing as dirt, it exists in the eyes of the beholder. So we always mean, oh sorry, I didn't mean that was too little <laughs> head fake. Um, but the question is, what does dirt signal? What does dirt mean? Uh, how do we connect it with kinds of people? Now we'll talk about trash. And like dirt, trash is not a natural, obvious category of the world. It's a concept that we impose onto the world. And um, something is trash when we decide that it is trash. So, so say you imagine you come home to your house at the end of the day, and there's some of your stuff uh, sticking out of trash bins on the curb. You didn't put them there. What would your reaction be? What the hell? That's my stuff. It's not trash. How did this happen? Now imagine if you put, if the same stuff was in the trash at the end of the day, but you put it there in the morning because you wanted to get rid of it, and you come home and you see it. You'll either have no reaction or maybe slight annoyance that it hadn't yet been picked up. So again, the stuff is the same, but how you categorize it as trash or not changes your relationship to it. Um, so our sense of possession to object is key in how we think of things as trash or not. Our attachment to objects as property as property is a uh, is a weird thing. So just I don't know. This is one kind of <laughs> tiny example. So I don't know how many of you, if you're paying for something in cash, uh, sometimes like I will get actually annoyed if if I if I mess up or not even mess up. I experience it as messing up. But if I get like four pennies back in change, it's like ah, oh, I don't want to do with this. <laughs> and you know, so a lot of times you see this compromise object where they take a penny and leave a penny bin. Um, you know, it's a placate neurotic people. <laughs> but again, how many of you have thrown out pennies? Put them in the trash. <laughs> yes, yeah, every so I'll just say right now, it's half of you, but you're all doing this. <laughs> But how many of you, how many of you have picked up a penny that you found on the ground? Oh, yeah. So, it's not true that a penny is a penny is a penny. Sometimes you can experience pennies, money, as trash. It's something to be thrown out. Other times, you experience it as a special call to you. Oh, it's, it's a penny. It's heads up. Like, this is my lucky day. It's shiny, and it's clean. It's shiny, and it's clean. Like, it, it's on the ground. It should be dirty. Clearly, this is some message that I need to act and now own this penny. Whereas that morning, you could have taken four pennies and put it in the trash because you were annoyed getting them back in, in change. So possession is, is a very weird thing. It's concerning the, the question of, of trash as property. In the early 70s, there was a self-proclaimed garbologist, A.J. Uh, Weberman. He was obsessed with Bob Dylan and knew where he lived in Greenwich Village, went to his apartment, and rooted through his trash. Now, apparently, this irritated Bob Dylan and his wife at the time to no end, so much so that at some point, Bob Dylan physically assaulted him. <laughs> Now, what, what was so upsetting about this? Would you be upset if you saw somebody rooting through your trash? Yes. yes. Yeah. Why? No. It's it's yeses, loud. And it feels like an invasion of privacy. If they're loud and making too much noise. If they're loud. <laughs> that's a di okay, that's a different concern. Say they're being very quiet. But they're going through your trash. They know all the it's weird creepy. stuff that you a lot of trash can involve. There's like information. Well, the about question is why. Yeah. 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 I mean, in my neighborhood, it's all the time. For people who don't like shred personal yeah. documents, it could be people who can like put together right. stuff and find mm -hmm. personal information. And right. they're creating a story about who you are based on what you're discarding, which I don't know that I want right. that. So our, Bob yeah. Dylan is also a very personal man. Right. <laughs> I'd ask you if there was anything specific they were looking for, and if I hadn't thrown it out, but was yeah. going to throw it out, I'd get it for them. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's, that's very common. Yeah. Yeah. So we might have a sense that our 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 identity is going to be violated in some way, or stolen, or um, it feels like an invasion of privacy, as Katie mentioned. Uh, but it's. You know, it's strange, like, 
you're throwing something out, which means you want to get rid of it. And then to see somebody else kind of claim it as their own, all of a sudden puts you in this weird state of, wait, uh, wait a minute, isn't that isn't still kind of mine? Isn't it still connected to who I am, my sense of self? Um, and so in this, in this case, what happened is there was the legal question of, does this act actually constitute uh, an invasion of privacy? And so it went to the courts, and New York then declared that, let me find the exact wording here, um, that yes, that once in New York City, if trash is on the curb, then it belongs to the city. <laughs> not to the person who put the trash out on the curb, and not to, not to anybody who wants to go through it. Uh, and technically they're not supposed to. It belongs to the city. And of course that's not the case if the trash remains on your property. This is time once it gets to city property. The objects you put on city property are then city property. These laws are local laws. They change from state to state, from city to city. Um, and they've, as you can imagine, also been interpreted as discrimination against the poor, who go through trash for a variety of reasons. Maybe to look for food, maybe to look for recyclables that they can then monetize for themselves. Um, federally, there aren't too many of these laws pertaining to crowd trash, although the Supreme Court has ruled that police do not need a warrant to search trash if it is outside your house. Outside your house or on the or Outside on your the house. Right. They, they don't need a warrant to search curbside trash. But if it's like next to your house? Oh, on still your on your I property. think if it's on your property, then, then they need a warrant. Yes, on killing you guys? Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> Watch out, Chris. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> so we can, uh, what happened? Did it fall asleep? Okay, as long as none of you fall asleep. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so what does it mean to throw something out? Um, <clears throat> in, you know, in urban environments, we rarely see what happens when you throw something away. You put it out in the trash, you put the trash in the curb, and it disappears. <laughs> and this sense of something disappearing is kind of the quintessential urban western experience of what trash is. So much so that you know, what's the icon for, for deleting something in the digital world? It's a trash can. This idea that you just, it's kind of the ultimate taking away, it's deletion. But of course, never mind our personal attachments to trash, to objects or trash. Um, you know, the very notion that trash gets taken away is not a very old one. It, it has specific histories in this country. So New York City became the first U.S. city with um, public garbage management, and that didn't happen until 1895. And before then, the streets looked like this. People would throw garbage and trash right into the streets. Uh, this could include general refuse, or in some cases, your, your dead horse. <laughs> now this photo is actually from the turn of the century. Uh, you can see the early automobiles in the back, but it, but it conveys the, the, the point. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so, we don't need this horse anymore, we have cars. <laughs> and, you know, what, what's spurred on uh, public garbage management in New York were public health crises. So, starting in the 1830s and then again in the 1860s, um, you saw people dying with diseases like typhus, cholera, yellow fever, and these are things that spread much more easily in neighborhoods that were particularly filthy. Uh, there was a cholera epidemic in the 30s that killed uh, over 3,500 people, which at that time was roughly 12% of the entire city's population. If that would happen today, that would be like 100,000 people dying because of shitty streets. And so the mortality rate in 1860 in New York City was um, equal to that of medieval London, just to give you a sense. So this, slowly, because it still took some decades, it was what led to our first, our country's first uh, gar public garbage management systems. Now, our relationship to trash has changed over time, and it depends too on the scarcity of consumables. So. What, are you going to open YouTube? <laughs> 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 See what's up. <laughs> so in the States, you started seeing these um, kind of domestic manuals, the frugal housewife, the, um, the complete home. 
And uh, one of these, which is actually not pictured here, from the 1820s, gave the following advice to women that, uh, women in particular, corn cobs could be dipped in tar and resin and dried for kindling. Corn husks could be used as mattress fill. Soap suds and ashes are good manure for bushes and young plants. Tea leaves, used tea leaves, could brighten the looks of a carpet and prevent dust. They could be scattered and rubbed about with a broom and then swept off. So you found um, a lot of practical advice into how, basically how not to ever create trash, how to constantly reuse objects, which you know, created a unique and profound form of stewardship of objects that maybe has disappeared over time. You need to know the things you possess pretty intimately if you are going to constantly be reusing them for different purposes. Um, this, could in, this also included cooking, being really clever with food leftovers. So there was a, this, this book, The Complete Home, in 1879 advised, you can afford to economize if you can make your cooked over dishes look handsomer than most people's first hand dishes. So this is one of the first times in kind of uh, a popular American culture that people started thinking about garnishes. Because you could take things that would normally be thrown out and make your food look prettier. Now, refrigeration. Um, interestingly, risk making people lazy. And uh, a lot of people used food less efficiently after refrigeration was, was introduced. So from that same book from 1879 uh, was the following observation that all too often uh, thrust odds and ends and scraps that are suffered to remain in refrigeration long enough to become malodorous and, will, and thus will taint other food. So. You know, I think that that actually is something that resonates with us now. You go into the fridge and you're like, oh, and you see <laughs> stuff is spoiled because you forget about it because it can stay, you know, in, a ref in refrigeration for longer than it would if it were sitting on your counter and it's visible and you know you need to use it. So basic technologies that we take for granted has actually changed our relationship with objects and changed our relationship with those objects as trash or garbage or not. Um, here's a great example. So Lee, um, who some of you know, who owns Cloud Club, he's not here tonight, but he uh, he's a bit of a, of a throwback where he does not throw anything out, and he is so good at repurposing objects. I mean, you might have noticed that there is a tree trunk in this place. <laughs> there are antlers sticking out of it. And just a few weeks ago, I was up here, another one of our housemates had an event, and a couple days before that, we had just some rickety chairs in our apartment, and they were. I was thinking, you know, these are these are one. They're ugly. They're falling apart, and they're getting to the point where they might collapse. So put them out on the curb, got rid of them, um, and uh, Drew, who uh, who's connected with the space and does a lot of work in it, um, actually found a couple of other chairs on the street that were much sturdier. Gave them to us, so we replaced them. All good. Fast forward a couple days to this event here in this space, and I'm talking with somebody, and I'm just hanging out, and, and, and I'm on a chair, and I just got this really familiar creak. <laughs> and I look down, and it's one of the fucking chairs that I threw out. So like, this, this space just has this like boomerang awesomeness where if you put something out on the curb, it's, I mean, nine times out of ten, Lee will re take it and repurpose it. He walks. Oh yeah, no, yeah, you can like try and take something down the street and put it in and it will just find its, find its way back. Um, you know, so it's both an artistic and kind of ethical orientation to the world. Um, you know, most people don't see what's being discarded as beautiful or useful. Uh, Lee tends to see them as both. Again, going back to Mary Douglas's notion of matter out of place, that's Typically, I think how we internalize a street line of garbage bags, you know, on trash pickup day, uh, but not not Lee. Um, now, this is in stark contrast to our um, larger reality. You have one job. There you go. Um, you know, in the United States, we, we, in the Western world, largely live in a consumption-based society. Our economy is based on consumption. 
Um, so much so that our, our everyday activities are just constantly accompanied by waste. You buy food and it comes in something that will need to be thrown out almost immediately, whether it's a coffee cup or a, a wrapper. And uh, the United States is the number one trash producing country in the world. We generate over 1,600 pounds per person per year. So that means that 5% of the world's population, that's the United States, generate 40% of the world's waste. That's problematic. Um, but let me transition to talk about shit. <laughs> now, I would say we probably, we probably could have an entire Lost Marble Salon on the topic of shit, maybe we will. Um, I think shit is kind of the quintessential primordial expression of waste. Uh, it, it's, it's what our bodies do to get rid of something. You put something in here and it comes out, some transformation happens and it leaves your body. Uh, what I'm going to talk about for the remainder of my talk is um, how this sort of waste has been repurposed in a variety of compelling ways. So we can talk about shit as fuel. Uh, feces, human feces, can be turned into biogas, which can be used for cooking, heating, electricity, which has become uh, an interesting proposal for countries that have a lot of si a hygiene and sanitation crises, uh, India, China. So, for instance, India is plagued kind of literally by large-scale hygiene um, problems caused in part by the common practice of open defecation, which is exactly what it sounds like. Um, most people do not have toilets or even access to toilets, and so they will defecate in public spaces. And that generates um, an enormous amount of sewage in the country. Uh, it's estimated that open defecation results in 100,000 tons of feces dropped in what time period, do you think? Just in India. One day. Oh. Oh. 100,000 tons. Oh, yeah. Shit. I know. That's a lot of shit. That's, that's almost as much as what like Fox News drops on broadcast. <laughs> that's easy. Don't. So now some of that actually, like they will go out of their way if they can to defecate um, like in fields so that it immediately becomes fertilizer. Uh, but most of it ends up elsewhere, like along railroads, and it can pollute water supplies. Um, so, it, so much so that India's Ministry of Urban Development recently concluded that literally everybody in the country who lives in a city is at risk for consuming human feces it's in some way, shape, or form. So. Some recently, there have been people trying to decide uh, to uh, design ways to hygienically um, and productively dispose of this, and including turning it into uh, usable fuels that can be used for heating, cooking, electricity, and so on. So some companies have developed these portable biogas units. Um, they basically work like septic tanks. Uh, in which anaerobic bacteria decomposes the excrement and gives off methane gas in the process. Uh, they're called biodigesters, and uh, and then there's there's like a leftover slurry too that individual households can use for fertilizer if they're doing any um, gardening or food growing. Uh, not not pictured in this in this picture is uh, Uncle Owen and Aunt Peru. <laughs> No. Ma'am, for those who get that, that's funny. <laughs> Kadu, did you have a question? Yeah, I was just wondering, the save that stuff do they do anything with shit? Uh, Say that again? Save that stuff, you know, the, the weird... Um, oh, it's a composting company. company oh. which, which does compost in Boston. No, I don't know. Um, if somebody does, I'm just I'd be curious to hear about that. Yeah. No, they won't even serve. Yeah. Like, they don't even no. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, we're talking about them. They're everywhere. <laughs> Sewage sludge can be converted into durable construction materials. Uh, it's usually mixed with, the sewage sludge is, sludge is often mixed with clay, and you can make um, like concrete hard bricks or tiles. Um, and it's, these materials are finding their ways into buildings. 
into highway projects as pavement. So people almost shit bricks. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yep. <laughs> Shit can be used as bio as a uh, kind of basic biological warfare. <laughs> Not the flaming bag of poop. Uh, but for instance, in the Vietnam War, the Viet Cong uh, made feces lined booby traps uh, to impale and infect people who might step into them. And, yeah. And some of the Colombian rebel groups fighting each other um, will use bombs that contain human feces to essentially accomplish the same thing. So you, I'm just I'm trying to paint a, a, a wild picture of the the social life that shit can have. Um, shit can be art. I don't know how many of you remember the Holy Virgin Mary um, by Chris Ophelia. In 96, which was um, a depiction of the Virgin Mary, and the medium was human feces. Elephant feces. feces. Elephant feces. Elephant feces. Thank you. Um, as Rudy Giuliani said, the idea of having so called works of art in which people are throwing elephant dung. Yes. I had a picture of the Virgin Mary is sick. So he did not, he did not see this as art. Um, another example. Jamie uh, Nichols is an artist who has made a, a perfume from his own excrement. It's called Surplus. <laughs> uh, Piero Manzoni, an Italian artist who in the early 60s came up with the artist shit, which was uh, a container of his own shit. Uh, shit can be experienced as sexually pleasurable, um, coprophilia, sexual arousal involving feces. Now, but this is also a socially threatening idea, and historically, psychiatry has towed this really careful line between um, medicalizing things and pathologizing social deviance, and so. Coprophilia is in the their current diagnostic. It actually manual. is in the five. Hmm? It actually is in the DSM five. It's definitely in the four, and I believe it is. Yeah, in I can the believe five it was in the four. Well. Okay. I think under the under paraphilia, oh. it is under five, uh, and they define it as the diagnosis is made if the behavior, sexual urges, or fantasies cause clinical clinically significant distress or impairment in social, occupational, or other important areas of functioning. So, this is. This is a, a, a tricky one in terms of how we experience it socially, culturally, and medically. Um, anybody have seen the human centipede? Oh. That's all I wanted to say. That's all I wanted to say. <laughs> wow. Shit is science. Coprolites. Coprolites. Fossilized dung. Um, are used to research ancient cu cultures to discover everything about diseases, from diseases, migration patterns, cannibalism. There's a lot you can learn from old shit. And then finally, shit is musical and literary inspiration. Um, it's well established that Mozart was, was deeply invested in scatological humor, uh, both in letters he would write and in his musical compositions. For instance, um, one of his canons had the line um, "Lectu mihi Mars," which Mozart intended to be heard as "Lectu mich i Marsh," which translates as "Lick my ass." <laughs> uh, around 40 of Mozart's letters contain direct references to defecation. One letter to his cousin contained the following lines, which rhyme in German: "Well, I wish you good night, but first shit into your bed and make it burst." Sleep soundly, my love, into your mouth, your arse you'll shove. <laughs> uh, and so this leaves, you know, contemporary cultural historians kind of uh, struggling to interpret this. And you get some people trying to medicalize it. I, maybe he had some form of Tourette's. Uh, and you have other people having, you know, more pop culture, not, not pop culture in the sense of, you know, 
Justin Bieber, but like the idea that someone might recruit lowbrow humor to critique um, highbrow culture, higher classes, and that's what Mozart was up to. Um, and then of course there's there's so a long tradition of scatological literature from Rabelais to Marquis de Sade's 120 Days of Sodom, Thomas Pynchon's Gravity's Rainbow, uh, Jonathan Swift, um, Strephon and Chloe. So shit is just human shit, which um, most of us experience um, as basically repulsive, at least say if somebody else's got on you accidentally, um, <laughs> has actually found its way <laughs> into, you know, engineering our personal cultural experiences in a variety of wild ways. So that that's it. That is my introduction to the to the topic of waste. <laughs> and, <laughs>